up this morning with me. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all we see, how great, how great is our God? So you put your hands together.
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Can we lift it up this morning, church? It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Oh, we worship you, Jesus, you're worthy. Come on, let's lift this up, you give life. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And we lift it up, church. Great are you,
this morning as we continue in worship, we're going to get ready for communion. So why don't you take a seat? For those of you who have volunteered to serve communion, you can go ahead and come down and begin distributing those elements. And thank you for doing that. And if you're not someone who calls yourself a follower of Jesus, you can feel free to let those trays pass you by. But I want you to know that this story, the reason for communion, Jesus' sacrifice, it is for all of us. And for those of you who are receiving communion, go ahead and hold on to those elements. Um, I wanna tell you a little story. Earlier this past week, I was driving around with my wife, Karen, and our three kids in the back, and I announced, hey, kids, you guys know that this week is Thanksgiving. And a collective cheer went up from the back seat. Yay! And I said, yes, yay! But this Thanksgiving, we have a new rule. No one is allowed to ask to leave the table. And my nine-year-old goes, why? And I said, because your mother and I are tired of spending days planning, preparing, and serving a meal, only to have one of you ask roughly four and a half minutes into it whether or not you can be done. And there was just silence from the back seat for a moment. And then my three-year-old chimes in and she goes, can we ever leave the table? I said, yes, I promise. At some point, you will be allowed to leave the table. But this time, I just, I want to press pause. I want to linger at the table because I want our meal to be about more than just the food. And that's what happened. We invited some of our loved ones around the table and we lingered. We laughed, we told stories, and we gave thanks And even though our table was filled with all of the familiar foods that are always part of our Thanksgiving meal, it was about so much more than just the food. And right now you guys are holding familiar elements to a familiar meal. But we know that this communion is about so much more than just the food because that bread represents Jesus's body broken for you. That cup represents Jesus' blood that he shed for you. It's a reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made, the punishment that we deserved that he took. It's a reminder of just how deeply God loves you. We have so much to be thankful for this morning at the communion table. And ordinarily, I would instruct us all to receive those elements together. But this morning, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to invite you to press pause and to stay at the communion table for as long as you need and then receive those elements when you're ready, whenever you're ready. Once you feel like you've had a chance to give thanks and we're going to continue in music, in a few moments, we're going to begin to sing again. But again, I encourage you, to linger and give thanks. Receive those elements when you're ready. Stand when you're ready. Sing when you're ready. But take this opportunity to press pause and give a much deserved thanks to God.
that there was no way I was ever going to work my way to you. And you came into that impossible situation and you made it possible. And God, for all of us, before we ever realized that that's where we were in an impossible situation, when we were still sinners, Jesus, you came in and you died for us. And you made a way possible. And right now in this room, there are people who find themselves in impossible situations, but in you, all things are possible. 
God, you have always made things possible that seem impossible. You are doing that now. You will do that in the future. So God, when we offer our thanks to you, we thank you for who you have been. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you for who you will be. God, our hearts are full of gratitude toward you. You deserve all the praise, all the thanks, all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. It is good to be with you in a week that for a lot of us was full of friends and family. Can we be friends and family together for just a moment? As you're finding your seats, can you say hey to a few people around you? Well, good morning, Willow Creek Community Church. Uh, you can do better. Good morning, Willow Creek Community Church. Now we're warming up. I like it. Welcome those of you watching online, those of you watching different venues of our church. And if you're new, if this is your first time, I'm so glad you're here. And uh, my name's Steve, if we haven't met. We'd love it if this is your first time. If after the service, you just stop by the info booth. It's called our Welcome Center. It's right over here. Stop by there and go, hey, it's my first time. We'd love to meet you, answer any of the questions you've got, and tell you a little bit more about our church. And right now, I want to invite our volunteers forward to receive our offering. Yep. Yeah, two things on this. Uh, one, if you're new, uh, don't feel any pressure to give. We're just grateful that you're here, too. The reason we cheer is that the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And so we celebrate every offering that we're giving back to our great God. And the reason we can cheer, the reason we can be grateful and joy-filled is because the Bible says from the first page to the back cover that God's been the provider. God's provided everything we have. All of it comes from his hand. And all he asks is so that we always remember him and are thankful is to give a tithe back and uh, out of it just to return it to him and say, God, thanks for what you've done. And that's what gives us joy and that's why we cheer. So I'd love to say a prayer of gratitude now for this offering. Can you pray with me? Yep, so Father, Father, in this week, marked by thankfulness, we are grateful that you've been the great provider. God, for us as individuals and families, God, for our church, God, thanks for how you've provided. Now, God, we return this back to you with gratefulness and with joy. Father, we love you. God, thanks for what you've done. And God, continue to do it in us. We pray this now together in the name of our Savior. Amen. So volunteers, you can begin to receive the offering. And while they're doing that, I want to tell you about a few things going on around our church over this next month. And uh, this uh, is the last weekend in November. And as we were thinking about these weeks in December, uh, we kind of thought one of the things we'd love to do is really be united as a church around prayer. And so we're going to start a prayer initiative, and we're asking everyone who calls this church home to take part in this. What we want to do is that every day you take a minute out of your busy run to just pause and to pray. And what we'll do is if you'll sign up for this and you've got the information on the screens behind me, if you just text the word prayer to this number, the pray actually this number, we'll send you a text from December 1st to December 21st. It'll have a Bible verse and it'll have just a little instructions on prayer. And our hope is that everyone in our church is just praying during these 21 days that as we pray, we'd be praying for God to work in our church through our Christmas Eve services and in our lives. And so I hope that you'll get out your phone, sign up for this. If you're someone that's more visual and you'd like a, a paper copy, you go to our website. We've got a calendar there that you can download and print off. And uh, we just hope our church is unified by prayer. Does that sound good? Yep, so that's just one of the things we're gonna do. That leads up to December 21st. That's the last day. And December 22nd is the day our Christmas Eve services start. We'll have six Christmas Eve services, and uh, we're asking if you're an owner of our church, if you, if you go, this is home, three things. One, uh, attend. Uh, to find time now in your calendar, go, this is the service we're going to attend as an individual or family. And if you would, to reserve seats there. And we have free tickets, free reservations, but it'll help us as we're planning to know which services are getting uh, overflowed. Uh, on this, uh, if you forget, don't worry about it, just show up. We're going to have some set aside for those who forget. But if you're an owner, it would really help us if you would reserve those tickets. Two, I'd ask you to be thinking about invites. Uh, we went through our church survey, and the number one reason someone comes to church is simply because a friend or a family member invited them. So Christmas season, many of our friends and family are willing to come to church, but they probably aren't going to do it without an invite from you. So just be thoughtful and prayerful. And then uh, make a real, uh, just a joy-filled invite to see if they'll come to church and see how God will use that. And third is to serve. 
If you're an owner of our church, we could use your help serving around the holidays. If you can serve to help make this a great experience for every guest who comes to our church, I think we're gonna have a wonderful Christmas. So attend, invite, and serve. Sound good? Yes. Awesome, four of you right down here, perfect. It's great. Yep. And now this week, uh, Wednesday night, Albert Tate is gonna be speaking at our midweek service. And we're doing something different during this uh, month of December. Our midweek services are actually gonna build on the content from the weekend. And so we're gonna be hearing more about this awestruck series in a minute. The midweeks, and Albert specifically this week, are gonna dive more into God's Holy Spirit, how you can hear his voice, how you can experience the Holy Spirit in your life. So that'll be a great Wednesday night for you to be part of. Then next week's a big weekend for us. Uh, I'll be teaching and continuing the series Awestruck. It's also our prison pack weekend. And uh, yep. If you're new in the last year or so, uh, one of the traditions of our church is one weekend every December, uh, we pack a gift for every single prisoner in the state of Illinois. So what we'll do next weekend is we'll have a normal service and then at the very end, right where you're sitting, uh, we'll pack gifts together and then our volunteers will begin distributing them. And uh, you go, well, why would you do this? Uh, the New Testament, there's clear instructions uh, that just says, as Christians, we aren't to forget the prisoners. We're not to forget them, we're to remember them. And so a simple gift, we've heard story after story how that brought hope to someone who was really struggling. And so we'll get the chance to do this together. We're gonna have a great service and um, I just think it'll be a great weekend. Sound good? Great, it'll be fun. Uh, now today, again, we're kicking off this series, Awestruck. And the idea behind this series is uh, in the midst of busy lives, uh, when you really look at the story of Jesus' birth, one common theme is that people were filled in awe of what the Holy Spirit was doing. And so to set up this time, we wanna give you a few minutes, both to hear a little bit and to hear some songs that really describe God's Holy Spirit's work in us. So for these next few minutes, again, engage your hearts and your minds in what God wants to do in you.
come awake to hunger to seek to thirst awaken first love come Would you pray with me? Yeah, let's pray, can we? Yes, yeah, so God, you are welcome here. You're welcome in this time, in this place, in this hour. God, we're gathered here for you. So God, speak and have your way in us. God, we're listening to you. We're listening to you. And Father, we love you. And we prayed this prayer of invitation to you in the name of our Savior. Amen. Amen. And amen. Yeah. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Hey, real quick, can we say thanks to our artists and musicians for leading us? Yeah, yeah great job. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so we're starting this brand new series and we have a guest teacher. And in August, when I stepped in, I told you a lot of pastors reached out and said they wanted to help. And one of them, uh, one of the first was Eugene Cho. Eugene's a pastor in Seattle. He's an author. He's a fantastic teacher. And he's going to kick off this series. So would you welcome Eugene Cho now to the stage? Hey, good morning, everyone. All right, thank you so much. It really is a joy and an honor uh, to be able to join you here on Thanksgiving weekend to launch this series. I want to share a story first, and then we'll go ahead and read our passage to begin our Awestruck series, and then I'll kind of give you a roadmap of how we'll spend the next 35 or so minutes. Uh, earlier this fall, I had a chance to visit one of your campuses, and um, uh, during or in between services, I met with one of the pastors who shared a brief story with me, and it was really encouraging, and it really touched me and convicted me as well. And we were just talking about the trying and difficult year that it has been for the Willow Church family. And as we were talking and sharing, she shared one story about uh, in the summer when they were going through their lowest of the lows. Uh, there was this pastor, an anonymous pastor, had driven in from somewhere out in the Illinois area, had driven into their church, walked into the staff offices, and he walked in. People weren't quite sure what that was all about, but he eventually had this basket of cookies and he dropped the basket of cookies at the staff offices and simply said, um, I just wanted you to know that uh, there are people thinking about you and praying for you. And it ministered to the staff so much. I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is I did not bring cookies today. <laughs> but I am here to remind you that you're not alone that we are part of the larger body of Christ. No, when we're celebrating the Lord's table, you're not just celebrating it with people that call Willow Creek their home church. You're celebrating it with brothers and sisters all over the world. And we need to be reminded of that theology of the body of Christ. And so this morning, even before I speak, I just want to take this moment to let you know that there are people thinking of you, praying for you, that we're praying for a spirit of courage and kindness and tenderness, for a spirit of truth-telling, of repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation, ultimately, so that God might receive glory even during this difficult time. So know that you're not alone. We pray for you. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to ask you to join me right now. We're going to be reading Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. The scripture is obviously behind me, but if you have your Bibles with you, or if you have your apps, I'd love to encourage you to open your Bible, to look, and to read for yourself as well. Now, I want to give you a little context. This here is... The Holy Spirit kind of speaking through Mary's soul. And Mary had just had a conversation with her cousin Elizabeth, who's about six months pregnant, and Elizabeth gives this word of affirmation of God's promises over Mary's life, and Mary bursts out into song. The Gospel of Luke is very interesting because it's the only gospel that records four songs around the Advent season, around the birth of Jesus. And this is the first of these songs. And theologians, pastors, Christians around the world, they often call this Mary's Magnificat, Mary's song. Earlier, we heard this beautiful, incredible medley about the Holy Spirit. And I was so convicted by our brothers and sisters who led us in song. I now want to ask you to use your imagination about how Mary might be singing the song, the song bursting out of her spirit. Now listen for God's word. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. 
From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Well, church, let me give you a roadmap of how we'll spend the next half hour. I want to first speak to you about the why behind Awestruck. In addition to that video that you saw earlier, I want to speak to you about the why as we begin the next several weeks on this Awestruck series. And then I want to speak with you about four things. I pray four practical, encouraging things that we can learn from Mary's story and about this song and about this particular passage that we just read. Now, let's speak about the why. Why awestruck? Why is this our series? Why does this matter in our lives and in our world today? In short, the opposite, the antithesis of awestruck would be routine. It would be complacency. It would be simply settling in for less or little, or not what God imagined for us. Especially as we're thinking about this Advent and Christmas season, when we're supposed to be in absolute amazement of the power of God, the glory of God, the goodness of God, as God sends his only begotten son, Jesus, and Jesus enters into the world as a little vulnerable baby, if you and I are like perhaps others. If you're like me, sometimes we take it for granted. I'll give you another example. It's the holiday season. Thanksgiving weekend just passed. Christmas is right around the corner. And if we're not careful, it becomes very routine. And as a result, routine can sound like regurgitation. We long for comfort, but if we're not careful, comfort becomes complacency. Complacency feels like apathy. For example, over Thanksgiving, you gathered with your families. Some of it might have been good relationships. Some of it might have been strained. We overate like crazy. Some of us experienced a sense of comatose state because we ate so much. And then we watched some football. Go Seahawks. Some of us attempted to actually play flag football. You got hurt, got rushed to the hospital. Maybe we participated in the Black Friday shopping. What I'm saying is there's kind of a routine. And after a while, we lose the sense of awe over this Christmas season. Maybe it's reruns of some of your favorite movies that you love watching. The sound of music, or It's a Wonderful Life, or in my opinion, the greatest movie, greatest Christmas movie ever made, Elf. My favorite line, we elves try to stick to the four main food groups, candy, candy canes, candy corns, and syrup. (laughs) But you get my point. It even leaks into our spiritual lives, into our church rhythms. It's possible that you walked into church today not with a sense of hope and expectancy, but a sense of routine. I'm here because I have to. I'm here because that's what Christians are supposed to do. I'm here because I'm checking my box. I'm here because my mom gave me the evil look. I don't know why you're here. 
It's possible that when Steve mentioned the title of the series and you were watching that video, maybe in your mind, you actually wrote the sermon in your head. I've been here, I've done this, I know exactly what this is about, and this series is exactly for you. We're praying that the Holy Spirit would stir and shake each and every single one of us no matter where you are in the spiritual journey, that the Holy Spirit would speak to you, touch you, stir your hearts, especially during this Christmas season as we're in amazement that God came near to us. Now, let me give you one more example to drive the point about why this matters. On Monday... August 21, 2017. Some of you, most of you will have no idea what I'm talking about, but as I share this, I bet some of you will know what I'm talking about. Monday, August 21, 2017 was a total mayhem in North America because we were experiencing a total solar eclipse. Some of you bought those eyeglasses or sunglasses. Some of you went outside. You took pictures with your kids. You took the opportunity to let them know how amazing the solar eclipse was. As a pastor, I loved it. I love that my church, my congregation, were really getting into this. I love moments in our lives when we're reminded there is something bigger and greater than the mundane that's in front of us, that God is at work. And what I mean by this is that when we were studying the solar eclipse, it was an opportunity to remind people, to teach people that our galaxy and the universe is vast and phenomenal and great. Did you know, for example, that there are 100 and billion known galaxies in the universe? When I was a child in junior high school, I wanted to be an astronomer. So I asked my parents to buy me a telescope and I still remember using this telescope to look at the Milky Way galaxy. There are a 100 billion Milky Ways in the known universe. Each galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars. Astronomers estimate as best as they can that in the known universe, the universe is home to a billion trillion stars. I don't know how many zeros that is, but it's a lot of zeros. And as people admire the stars, as people revel in our galaxies, what I try to tell them is, listen, there is a God who created those very stars. There is a God who created the galaxies. There is a God behind all that is good and beautiful. And yes, even to us, those who are self-professing Christians, would you take a moment, pause, and be in awe at the power of God. The power of God. It's stunning to me when I think about the biggest star known to us in humanity. It's a sun called the Canis Majoris, which is 2,100 times larger than our sun that warms up our earth. It means, because of the size disparity, that that particular sun, Canis Majoris, it would be able to house 9.2 billion of our suns in that particular star. This is our God. Take a moment, breathe. God, the God of the cosmos, sends his only begotten son. And this baby, consumed in flesh and bone, just like us, enters into human story. Why? For God so loved the world. May you be awestruck. May you be amazed by the goodness of God. This is why I love 
how the psalmist in chapter eight, verse four says, who are we as mere mortals that you would be so mindful of us? That's why we're taking some time to consider this theme, awestruck. Now let's study Mary's life. Four things that I want you to consider, marinate on as we particularly study her song. Here's the first one, and it might not speak specifically to Mary, but it speaks to the cultural context during her time. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes or writing notes in your mind, it's this, the Holy Spirit is still on the move. The Holy Spirit is still on the move. Now, what do I mean by this? If we're all honest, there are going to be moments in our lives where we say, God, where are you? Where are you in my pain? Where are you in my loneliness? Where are you in my isolation? Where are you when this is not what I imagined for my life? Every single one of us, I know I don't know you hardly at all, but if there's a common denominator here, it's that there's pain and there's fear in every single one of us. And there may be moments in your life where you have uttered that question, God, where are you? And I want you to know that's the context in which Jesus enters the story of humanity. During this time, there were numerous things that were going on, unjust things, painful things, hurtful things, destructive things going on around the Bible context and Bible days. I'll give you an example. There was a ruler by the name of Caesar Augustus who issues a decree for a census to be taken. It's part of that Christmas, Jesus's birth story. But what a lot of folks don't know is the why behind that census. It wasn't because they wanted just better, accurate information to care for the people. It was actually the opposite. They wanted a more accurate census in order to be able to tax people appropriately and more accurately. Why? because they wanted more resources to build their military and to build the expansion of the Roman Empire and to continue their dominion and domination over nations. Some history buffs would call this the security of the Pax Romana. That was the state of this time that Jesus was born. We can't ignore this military power of the Roman Empire during this time. We're also familiar with the story of King Herod out of his fear and insecurity, how he initiates a massacre of all Jewish baby born boys during this time. How dark, how painful, and how difficult. In fact, between the Old and New Testament, there was approximately 400 years of what we perceive to be silence. There were no prophets. There were no prophetic words. There were no words of encouragement. There were no worship teams singing medleys and such. It was a time of darkness and discouragement. There was growing hostility and division between Jews and Gentiles. Samaritans were absolutely ostracized. There was so much disparity between the rich and the poor. That was the time in which Jesus enters into human story. That's the context in which Mary sings this song. So what's my point? It's really important. Here it is. Even when it feels or looks or appears that God is absent God is actually at work. The Holy Spirit is still on the move. And this is so important for us to know. Because you and I, if we're honest, we're driven by our feelings. And as a pastor, I hear so many congregants, including myself, will say, well, I don't feel God. I don't feel God's nearness. I don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not trying to diminish your pain or your feelings. I just simply want to remind you that God meets you where you're at. And this is the time that it's good to be reminded that behind the scenes, God is still at work. 
And what a beautiful story. Here's the second thing for us to be reminded of. During the time of Mary and over the next few weeks, you'll learn about Zechariah, you'll learn about Simeon, you'll learn about Elizabeth. If you and I were alive during this particular time, many of us would respond by saying these words, who? Who? M Mary who? Zechariah who? Elizabeth who? Who are these folks? If we're honest, we have sort of a hierarchy of importance. It exists today. It also exists during the Bible days as well. And the story of Mary and others is a great reminder that God's ability to use you is actually not contingent on you. God's ability to use you is not contingent on your ability. I'm not trying to knock or dismiss your jobs, your titles, your degrees. I'm not trying to say it's irrelevant. I'm simply saying that God's ability to use you, the Holy Spirit's ability to move you is not based upon your ability, but simply your availability. For you to say, yes, I'm here. I'm here, God. I want to be used by God. I want to be humble. I want to be open. Rather than a posture of having your arms closed for whatever reason, to have a posture of openness and humility. Oh, I think about Mary, and yes, Mary who... She was poor, she was young, she was inconsequential. She came from Nazareth, and you heard later what people said so brashly about Jesus. What good comes from Nazareth? Translation, you're useless. Your resume, your lineage is useless. But this is the story of God, the Holy Spirit, And you should be encouraged today because I can speak with absolute confidence that every single one of us here today is flawed, broken, and imperfect. And if you don't agree with me, you struggle with lying. <laughs> All of us are flawed, broken, and imperfect. In fact, if you were to read the Bible from cover to cover, with the exception of Jesus Christ, fully God, fully human, perfect, the Bible only has stories of flawed, imperfect women and men, and God still uses them. Now, I've heard pastors share these lists with different titles and different names, but here's my list of women and men that God chooses to use. Abraham and Sarah were, they lied, concealed, I'm sorry, Adam and Eve lied, concealed, and accused. God does not abandon them. Abraham and Sarah were old, which meant back then they were no longer useful to society. They had serious marriage issues. Noah was a drunk, Jacob was insecure, Joseph was abused, sold into slavery by his own brothers. Imagine that Thanksgiving dinner. Moses had a stuttering and confidence problem. Esther was an orphan. Elijah struggled with depression. Gideon was poor, which meant in that cultural context, he was cursed by God. Rahab was a prostitute. David had a list too long for this sermon. Jonah was rebellious, unwilling to listen to God's instructions. John the Baptist was just weird. <laughs> Martha was a type A workaholic. The Samaritan woman had numerous failed relationships. Thomas had doubts. Matthew was a tax collector who worked for the villainous Roman Empire. Paul was a Pharisee, a persecutor of Christians. Timothy was timid. Mary was poor. My point is this, Willow Creek, add your name to this list. Add your name to this list. If you're breathing and alive right now, the Holy Spirit is able to work and move through you. Oh, that encourages me. And I hope that it encourages you. Here's the third thing. Keyword, relationship. Now, what do I mean by relationship? I want you to know 
that Mary's song, yes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it's not something out of the blue. It's not out of a vacuum that the Holy Spirit stirs the song. It comes out of a relationship, a daily, a steadfast, a dependent relationship with God and the Holy Spirit. You see, when we read stories like this, if you're like me as Christians, we think to ourselves, well, why can't I have an experience like this? We're so enamored by the supernatural things, by the spectacular things, and I'm not saying that God isn't able to do that because clearly we just read it, but what we miss in the story, what's not recorded accurately is how Mary, on a daily basis, walks with God, seeks after God, knows God's word, studies God's word, hears God's voice in her life. It speaks to us so much about the importance of relationship. The best way for us to grow in our dependence on the Holy Spirit, to grow in our relationship with God, is to engage in a relationship with God every single day, in the daily, in the mundane, in the ordinary. Not just when you're seen, not just during Christmas season, but who we are, how we live our lives, when no one's watching us, when no one's paying attention to you, in our small groups, in our section groups, in our neighborhoods, in our dad groups, in our mom groups, in our workplaces, how we live our lives daily, open in our posture to the Holy Spirit, that matters to God. Relationship matters. If I'm losing you, let me give you this analogy. Right now, I'm uh, seeing a, uh, a trainer. because I'm trying to get a little healthier as I approach my 50th birthday in a couple of years. I'm 48 years old. Uh, props to Asian genes. And uh, so turning 40, 50 fairly soon, and I'm seeing this uh, trainer, and I'm trying to get to a point where I can do 100 push-ups at a time. And I'm very far away from that, okay? <laughs> Some of you were really impressed until I said I'm very far away. And you're like, ah, oh, loser. So 100 push-ups. And I'm like talking to my physical trainer. And I'm like, uh, help me. And this is his best advice. He says, uh, Pastor Cho, the best way to become better at push-ups is to do push-ups. And at first, I was like, um, I'm paying you for obvious advice, but sometimes it's the obvious that's so profound. How do you hear and walk and build a relationship with God? You build it every single day. You take one step at a time. You learn how to pray. You learn how to hear God's word. You learn kindness and tenderness. You know what it means. And we ask the Holy Spirit every single day, Holy Spirit, speak to me. I want to be open and available to you. In other words, build your relationship with God. Here's the fourth thing, and it's this. Mary was brave. Mary was brave. Now, let's talk a little bit about her context. Theologians debate about her age. We know that she was very young, especially from our cultural context. In our cultural context, this marriage or engagement would be illegal in our cultural context. Now, again, theologians, they aren't in absolute agreement because no one knows for sure what her precise exact age is. But let me give you some ballpark figures. They believe that Mary was approximately 12 to 14 years old when the engagement takes place. During that cultural context, engagements could last for many years. It could last a year, a couple years, but the distinction between engagement then and now is that when you were engaged, you were essentially married to that person. So the initial engagement, 12 to 14 years old, so the angel visits her, gives her this promise around that age, and then they also believe she was approximately 14 to 16 when she delivers birth 
to Jesus Christ. She was poor. And as I shared earlier, to be poor during the cultural context meant basically you were seen as cursed by God. Even religious people would use erroneous theology to explain why people were poor, blaming fault on them. She came from Nazareth, and the list goes on and on. Yes, Mary is brave, but here's an important point I want you to know. You've got to hear this. I cringe at the ways that sometimes people including other pastors, talk about bravery or courage. When we're speaking about being brave or being courageous, it does not mean that it's the absence of fear in our lives. That's not what bravery is. If you and I, if we're honest, because we're human beings, every single one of us, we have pain, we also have fear. To be brave does not mean that you're fearless. To be brave means that you're human. And as a follower of Jesus, you acknowledge the fears that are present in your life. And by God's grace, even as we tremble, even by as we're somehow unsure, to be brave means that we believe and have faith that God in me through the Holy Spirit is greater than the presence of fears in my life. That's what brave means. It doesn't mean that we're going to somehow somehow remove all fears out of our lives. It creeps up in every single one of us, but that's what bravery means. Let's take Mary's life, for example. It's not recorded, but for me, as I study the scriptures, my imagination thinks, I wonder what it must have been like. Initially, she was afraid. And the angel comforts her, reminds her of God's promises, reminds her of God's presence. But can you imagine what that first, second, third conversation must have gone like with Joseph? Joseph, good news, I'm pregnant. I just can't imagine what Joseph must have said. What? How could you? How dare you? How could you betray me? What? An angel? The Holy Spirit? Are you crazy? We like to knock on Joseph, but how many of us would have responded in that same way? And the angel has to appear to Joseph to remind him, it's okay, what Mary said is indeed true. Can you imagine what her family must have said? How dare you bring shame to our family? How could you do this to us? Don't you know it's already so hard for our family? And how could you? You're insane. Can you imagine how people in her town must have responded to her? Nazareth was a very small town. Again, theologians, they think roughly 100 to 200 people. Translation, it's a town where everyone knows everyone and everyone wants to know everyone's business. The first couple months, maybe Mary, unsure, keeps things to herself, but eventually there's that baby bump and the next thing you know, people are asking questions, then speculating, then the gossip. There were those who were so abrasive, they were speaking out loud. You're a horrible person, you're sinful. How could you do this to Joseph? And then there are those who are gossiping behind the scenes. And every single time I'm thinking of Mary being reminded of the fear of loneliness, rejection, isolation. And you know what I think Mary did? I think Mary remembered her song. That song that the Holy Spirit inspired 
inspires out of her gut, out of her spirit when she sings, God, you are good. Your arm extends to the nations. You are merciful. You will call me blessed. I think she remembers that song. And I want you to know she sings that song not just once in Luke chapter 1. She sings it days of her lives when she's reminded of fear, reminded of loneliness, reminded of rejection. She's singing that song over her life. A great translation of her song, I think, is the song that we sang earlier. God, you are a way maker. You are a promise keeper. You are a light in our world. So here's my question to you. What is your song? The song over your life when God intervened in your life, extended mercy and grace to you, when God gave you a word, when God gave you a promise, when God answered your prayers and you uttered words of gratitude, do you remember that song? Because we need to sing that song over our lives again and again and again. Many years ago, when I was in my mid-20s, I, was, uh, I had to go through my ordination process to become a, a minister of the word and sacrament through my denomination. And as I was going through this process, part of that uh, process was that I had to go see a psychiatrist and a therapist. And so I wasn't feeling all that excited about paying $800 over numerous hours to spend time with a psychiatrist, but I had to do this. And so I made an appointment and I saw someone named Dr. Brown and she was good. I walked in, I was very just upset. I had, my body posture was probably very insular and she looked at me and she goes, "Um, Eugene, you don't wanna be here, huh? And I said, yes, I do. I wanna be here. (laughs) She was good. But eventually she realizes that she needed to give me some time. So she goes to the closet, brings out this gallon of uh, chalk, crayons, and markers. And then she goes back to the closet, takes out this huge butcher roll of paper, rolls it on the ground. And then she says to me, Eugene, I want to give you some time. And I want to invite you, would you just draw your life? At first, I was like, I am not paying you 800 bucks an hour for a drawing lesson. But she eventually leaves. I'm imagining she's behind this like mysterious glass window where I can't see out, but she's looking through me, laughing at my insecurities. But I had to do this, so I take a crayon and I make a circle and I draw it in and I write down October 20th, 1970, which in Korean means Eugene Cho was born. Remember my birthday, October 20th, 1970. <laughs> and then I started graphing my life, the ups and downs. And it was kind of interesting because to be honest, I'm so busy in the here and now on the next thing that I rarely, if ever, take a moment to consider the big picture of my life. There was a down moment when there was a really painful experience in our family where we were separated. And to this day, when I think about it, it gives me tears. Maybe another day I'll share more. And then in 1977, things got a little more challenging when my parents decided not to tell me that we were moving from Korea to the United States, getting on an airplane for the very first time, getting off the airplane and realizing no one looks like me and struggling through the challenges of immigration, struggling through xenophobia and bullying. In first grade, the scariest thing that I could think of was raising my hand as a seven-year-old boy who could not speak English, but the problem was I had to go to the bathroom a couple times. And so I would pee in my pants, and the first grade kids were 
ruthless. Middle school was challenging because I was voted the shyest kid in middle school and developed a stuttering problem. And high school had its challenges as well. But little by little, as I look back, I saw the ups and downs of life. When I was 18 years old, there was this momentous event in my life when I met this Hispanic custodian, a Mexican custodian by the name of Raimondo Gonzalez. He worked at the same building that my mother had her small little deli shop at an IBM building in Sunnyvale, California. And Raimondo would come up to me and we became good friends. I labored through four years of Spanish to be able to understand and speak Spanish. And Raimondo would come up to me and would say, Eugenio, my name in Spanish, Eugenio, tú necesitas a Jesucristo en tu corazón. You need Jesus Christ in your heart. And every single day, he would say, Eugenio, ¿quieres aceptar Jesús Cristo en tu corazón? Do you want to accept Jesus in your heart? And I would joyfully say, no. <laughs> in the summer of 1989, one of the highest moments of my life, I met Jesus. Next thing you know, I'm like looking at this butcher paper and I'm just crying. As I look back, I see the arm of God. I see the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember your song? Sing your songs of joy and gratitude, of amazement, of being awestruck at the goodness of God. Sing your song. It's during these days where we feel pain or loneliness that we need to remember that our God is a promise keeper. He's a way maker. He is a light in our world. So God, we thank you so much for your amazing goodness and grace. I pray for my brothers and sisters here at Willow. God, remind us, help us to remember, to rejoice in you that you've already deposited these songs and that you're writing more lyrics, but help us to sing these songs. Help us to be in awe of who you are and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. Hey, would you stand up? I got two things. And again, Gene, Eugene just shared his story, the ups and downs. Some of you, this is a tough time, and the holidays just magnify it. If you could use prayer right through these doors is our prayer room. We've got staff and volunteers who would love to pray for you. As well, I mentioned it earlier, if this is your first time, please, on your way out, stop by our welcome booth. We'd love to meet you. We'd love to get to know you just a little bit. My challenge to you though, just that one word, that this season would be filled with awe. That this wouldn't be same old, same old this Christmas season. This one would be marked by awe of what God has done and what he wants to do in you, yes? Can we give another hand to Eugene for blessing us? Eugene, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you back next weekend. Blessings everybody, take care.